Hello boys and girls and welcome back to another episode of Ushanka Show – Stories about life in the Soviet Union. Здравствуйте, мальчики и девочки! В эфире программа Ушанка Шоу – истории про жизнь в Советском Союзе. So recently I got email from Michael and he had a question. Dear comrade Sergei, in the Soviet Union did small towns exist? Obviously they did. Were there communities in sizes between villages and the cities? What was the residents' lives like? Did they live in houses or apartment buildings? Do they have public utilities like sewer, water and electricity? Do they have small stores, emergency services? I enjoy your videos, thank you and please keep up the good work. Michael. And you know, as I thought about it, it's actually a great question to cover. So today we're going to talk about Soviet small towns. And we will begin with a short lesson of Russian language. Rok Ruskova Yazika. Muhasransk. Muhasransk. That's kind of like a generic term for any small town, middle of nowhere, Russia. Muhasransk. I asked my American colleagues and they told me that in American English there is also a similar term. It's called Hicksville. And it's what pretty much what Muhasransk, just some random lost middle of nowhere town when hardly anyone lives or hardly anything going on. Hicksville and Muhasransk. Well, I believe Muhasransk is a better term because it could be translated as a fly shitville. So picture small town. There is still cows grazing on some streets. There is still horses. So there is a manure laying around covered with flies. And as those flies land on the glass, you know, on the windows, whatever, they leave these little droppings. And that's why the whole town is like covered with flies shit. Muhasransk. Fly shit will. And I believe in the science language, there is probably a special term for Muhasransk or Hicksville. And I'm sure other languages have a similar expression like Muhasransk. So if you guys live somewhere in Europe, Asia, South America, please provide what do you use instead of Muhasransk. By the way, when you enter Muhasransk into the Russian AI image maker, and this is the image you're going to get. But before we can talk about small towns of the Soviet Union, we need to look at the big picture, look at the whole USSR and how it was kind of divided, separated in a smaller area. So you start from republics, like, you know, Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic, Belarusian Republic, and so on. And then each republic had so-called oblasti. And that's, you know, you have a pretty large town and it will be in charge of a specific area. And each oblast will be subdivided in so-called rayone, so maybe like counties. And that's the, the center of rayon. That would be your small town, right center. That will be your Muhasransk. You probably know that Soviet Union consisted of 15 republics. So you had major, of course, was Russian Soviet Socialist Federation. So there was a federation of small republics and then we had 14 republics like my Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic and others. So first 15 republics. And since I'm the most familiar with Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic, we're going to work through map of Ukraine. So you see here, this is the map of Ukraine and those small borders inside, this is so-called oblasty. So you see there's a quite a few of them. And then just a quick reminder, Ukraine is about the size of Texas and it has 24 oblasts, so 24 regions. Then temporarily occupied Crimea, which is officially the Autonomous Republic of Ukraine. And then we had two cities of special status like Republican level cities. It's Kyiv, capital of Ukraine, and Sevastopol, which is located in occupied Crimea right now. And since I Familiar the most with northern Ukraine, we're going to talk about Chernigovskaya Oblast, Chernigiv region in the north of Ukraine. That's what my mom's village is located. And here's another map of Chernigiv region. This one shows the names of small towns. So this is besides Chernigiv, which is I'll show in a minute. The rest will be probably considered your Hicksvilles, your Muhasransky, just a small towns, maybe population from 2,000 to 10,000 people and not much going on in those places. And during the Soviet days and for a while after Ukraine became independent, Chernigiv region had the total of 22 rayones, so 22 counties. But back in 2020, mostly due to the shrinking population, 
The amount of this county's rayone in Chernigov region was reduced from 22 down to only 5. So the small town I want you to tell about today, Snovsk, lost its status as a county center, or we will call it Rayonny Center, Rai Center. So here you see the symbols and the original map of Snovsky Rayon. Actually, during the Soviet days, the name of the town was Shores. We'll talk about it a little bit later. But this is the original rayon when I used to go there and stay in the village with my grandparents back in the 70s and 80s. And now my Snovsky rayon became a part of the larger Kariukovsky rayon with the right center, so county center in Kariukivka. If you follow my channel, you probably remember that I was talking a lot about spending my summers in the northern Ukraine, in the village where my mother originally came from. So every June, I would travel by bus from Kiev through Chernigiv, through Snovsk, to village of Zhovid, and it's a total of 240 kilometers. And right now, Google Maps says they'll take about three and a half hours to reach the destination. Back in the day, when we used public transportation, long distance buses, we left our apartment at 6 a.m. and we arrived to the village at 6 p.m. So it took 12 hours to cover 240 kilometers, which is roughly about 100 40 miles, something like that. And that bus ride felt like a trip back in time because I would leave modern city, capital of the Soviet Ukraine, and then 140 kilometers later, we would arrive to Chernigiv, which is smaller. I don't know if you still call it a city. I guess a city. But you would notice already changes. There'll be older vehicles. There'll be more people riding bicycles. There'll be quite a few old ladies you know, wearing head scarves on the bus station. So it felt like you moved back in about 20 years just by arriving to Chernigiv. And this is Chernigiv's train station. Beautiful building, really impressive. I took this photo in Chernigiv back in 2009. So this shows you the contrast. You got young Devushka, young lady, and old Babushka staying next to each other. So there was a quite a bit of contrast, but you see way more people like that on the streets in Chernigiv than anywhere in Kyiv. So after spending about three and a half hours riding the bus from Kyiv to Chernigiv, I would spend another maybe two, maybe three hours waiting for another bus to take now from Avtovokzal bus station in Chernigiv to our next destination, which was Shores, modern day Snovsk. And once again, modern days Google will tell you it takes about an hour to get from Chernigiv to Snovsk, but on reality, on a slow moving bus, it took almost two hours. And of course, we had a stop in the middle for about 20 minutes. And we stopped in a town called Berezna. So this is, will be your another example of small town, Muhasransk. And this is the street scene. I took it as picture once again in 2009. So these old ladies, Babushki, arrived on the bicycles by the main highway and they're trying to sell their apples. And in the background, you see old Soviet era cars, Volga and Moskvich. And after arriving to Shores around 5 p.m., my parents would race to the bus station office to purchase another set of tickets, this time from Shores to the village, which is another 30 kilometers and another hour. And this is the bus station on Shores. Of course, it looked way better during the Soviet days. Right now, it's completely abandoned. They discontinued bus services. Now, there's plenty of people have their own cars or there's a private taxi service. But I remember this place was just teamed with life. There was a bunch of people waiting for their buses. Buses are coming and going. Of course, it's all gone now. And the picture I showed you earlier, it's actually a train station in Shores. So it was renamed to Snovsk in 2016. So I took this photo once again in 2009. It has Ukrainian flag, but there's still old Soviet name, Shores. And while researching for this story, I stumbled upon the picture of the original bus station in Shores. And this is the picture of your typical Soviet Muhasransk, Soviet Hicksville. There is not even a black top, right? Just puddles, dirt, and this is bus station. And some quick facts about Snovsk, former Shores. It's city now. Well, they call it city. Well, it's a town in Karyukivka Rayon, Chernigov Oblast of Ukraine. So current population about 10,620 people. In 2001, so 20 years ago, it was 12,000 people. So definitely even the town is shrinking. And it's way worse in surrounding area in the villages. 
they literally dying out. Okay, so what about these dual names, Shores and Snovsk? So Snovsk was the original name of this town, but in 1935 was renamed into Shores after Mykola Shores, who happened to be born in Snovsk, and then he became famous Soviet military commander during the Civil War. He got killed in 1919 and became kind of like the one of the heroes of the civil war between reds and whites. So arriving to Shores would feel like you moved back in time for another 20 or 30 years, although we didn't stay alone there because we had to race and hop on another bus. But you will see now horse buggies, people riding horses, you know, doing their errands. So almost like Amish country, but it's a Soviet Union country that sent the first man into space, first satellite in space, and even in 70s and 80s, people were still using horse buggies. So the town grew around to the train station. They also had a large train depot that they worked on as steam trains. And I think they still have a crew that can repair steam trains. So that's kind of cool, interesting part. And I actually remember when I was riding on the bus and we were crossing the railroad tracks. On the left there was a long row of steam trains just parked there in the long-term storage, I think it was the plan in case of the big war when infrastructure would collapse, there'll be no electricity, they will refire up the steam trains to continue moving goods around the Soviet Union stricken by nuclear weapons. Okay, I want you to look at this photo one more time. This picture was taken on April 17, 1982. In 1982, they still worked on steam trains. Is that something they just finished working on washing the train? So they were cleaning the steam boilers and it's ready to go again. 1982, black and white photo of the steam train that's still in service in the Soviet Union. So it looks like the train depot was the one of the largest employers in Snovsk. They also had, of course, milk processing plant which collected milk from all the collective farms in the area in their county processed it and then sent cheese and sour cream not back to the villages but to moscow and kiev a small correction that milk processing plant was called masla zavod so literally butter making factory and what's interesting i remember my grandma always asked to bring in butter when we came to spend vacation in the village so milk will be collected in the villages, taken to uh, Snovsk Shores, processed to butter, shipped to Kiev, and then we will bring that butter back all the way to the village. Fun fact, besides the collective farms, every household that owned a cow was required to sell some milk to the collective farm. And then of course all the milk together will go to the butter making factory. And I remember every morning my grandma will set up outside on that little bench by the street, you know, like three liters of milk. And there'll be a guy riding a, believe it or not, horse buggy with the milk jugs. And he will collect the milk from all the households, you know, writes down how many liters he collected. And I believe uh, people were paid four kopecks per liter. And I'm talking about late 70s, early 1980s, when people were still riding horse buggies in Ukrainian villages to collect milk. And it looks like Snovsk also had a small uh, furniture making factory. I never heard of it. I never seen furniture made by them. So that was a major employer. Train depot, butter making factory and furniture making factory. And of course there's retail stores, all these people that ran the area that I own. So there was a, quite a few jobs available in that town. And back to the question. So. Towns like that, this little Muhasransk, they were pretty much like glorified villages. There were some five-story high buildings like Khrushchevka style, and those was the best housing option available in those towns because they'll have a running, hopefully even hot water, so running water, they'll have indoor plumbing, so they didn't have to use outhouses. But the majority of people would live in the small homes like in the villages outhouse, no running water. They may have natural gas supply. And the only improvement comparing to normal village would be they'll have a blacktop roads around. So otherwise, yeah, glorified villages. And people will have a small plots of land, 0 0.6 hectare, where they grow their own potatoes and veggies and stuff. They may have a pig. So literally, 
maybe in the center downtown they'll look a little bit like town and the rest of that uh, place would look just a normal village. Cows in the morning go out in the fields to graze in the meadows. You'll hear roosters, you'll hear pigs. So yeah, that's your everyday life in small Muhasransk. So here's Snovsk downtown. At that time was Shors, sometimes in 1950s. So you have obligatory monument of Lenin to the left, the guy with a stretch arm showing the way to the communism. So this is how it looked in the 50s. And this is the look of the new downtown of Shores. This photo was taken sometimes in early 2000s to Lenin, the monument still standing. It was removed later, like 10 years later, but you could see already there's a, a cell towers installed on the top of the building. And this modern building was built in early 80s. So you have this kind of modern concrete style. And this is the main uh, office, so-called Raikom. So this is the management office of the old Shorsky Rayon. And sometimes in 1970s, they built this movie theater called Kinotheater Cosmos, so movie theater space. So you see the cosmonaut flying among the stars. It's kind of interesting choice of the name for the movie theater in middle of nowhere uh, town. And you see there's a crane in the background, so they're getting ready to build a new office next door to it. In modern days, this movie theater was converted into supermarket. Now a small correction, it looks like that modern building is actually was a palace of culture or the building of culture. Right now it's called Rayonne Budina Culture. So it's like original building of culture. And that's when they have exhibitions. That's what the youth on Fridays have a little discotheque. So that's the place where the people can entertain. We're right now at the small town of Snovsk. That's kind of like original town when my mother village is located. And it's funny, my kid was hunting Pokemons around here and the, this place was called the Lost Lenin of Ukraine. So that was one of the latest, last uh, Lenin monuments still in exist, it existed, but apparently people came from Kiev or maybe Western Ukraine and they knocked it down. So this is the place where the Lost Lenin of Ukraine was still located. And of course this town had his own hospital and ambulance which we called Skora Medicinska Pomash, Speedy Medical Help and this is the crew from that town. I'm not sure this picture was probably taken sometimes in 70s or 60s. It's hard to tell. It's always black and white. It's definitely a UAZ Buhanka vehicle and look at the nurse's toolbox. It looks like a metal toolbox for tools but that's her uh, medical kit. And speaking of speedy medical help, you need to remember that it could be speedy only around that town because the villages like mine, 30 kilometers away, hardly anyone own a landline. It's only maybe main uh, collective farm office and a postal office will have a landline. Otherwise no one had the phone. So in case of something going on in the middle of the night, you need to first run or ride the bicycle to the person who can unlock the building to get to the phone, call the ambulance, and then it's 30 kilometers driving. Although we had a blacktop road, so they could get pretty fast, but the whole process of getting to the phone will pretty much reduce chances of survival. Anybody who has like emergency heart attack or something. So it was speedy only in town. Villages, uh, good luck. And here's the photo of a local cool guys. This picture was taken during their graduation, like party. So that's why they dress nicely with the ties. And friend of mine, Dima, grew up in a similar small town. And he always complained that after dance, if you walk the girl home, the next day your parents would know about it. Because this town is so small that everyone knows everyone. So the next day, all the town knows, hey, Dima started dating Natasha or he was uh, walking her home. So that was the main challenge of living in such a Muhasransk. And of course, they also had parades, May Day Parade, May 9 Parade, October 7th Parade. And this is the picture, it looks like a May Day Parade. Of course, it's way smaller than we had in Kiev. But once again, you have a, uh, pictures of the leaders of the Soviet Union in the background. So that looks like 1980s right here. And just on the outskirts of Shores, uh, there was this museum dedicated to freeing the area from the German occupation, which had occurred in 1943. So that was a popular place to take uh, class photos, as you see at this picture. And of course, if any accident would occur, everyone would know about it right away. So it looks like sometimes in 1980s, they had a, a train went off the rails right 
on the main area in the train station. And there's a picture and there's onlookers on the bridge. And even now you could see this on the streets of Shors, Snovsk. Of course, now it's a private tractor, not collective farm tractor, still hauling manure to the fields. And of course, there's way more cars on the roads now, even in that small town. But still, for majority of people, bicycle remain the main means of transportation. And I took this photo back in 2019. You could see that the Dvarets Kulturi, the house of culture in the background. And my son, Oliver, is checking out this unusual for Ukrainian countryside vehicle. It's a Ford Econoline. And what these guys did, they swapped the engine, they installed Mercedes diesel from the Sprinter, and they were making money by driving it every day across the border into Russia. Back then, border was open. They will fill up both tanks because this is a dual tank vehicle. They will fill up with the Russian diesel fuel, drive back to this town, sell the fuel to the local gas station, turn around and drive back again, just driving on empty to fill again. I think they did two trips every day because by the law you were required, you were allowed to bring fuel just in your tanks. They were originally original design. So this vehicle provided the most capacity to smuggle diesel fuel without paying any taxes on Russian or Ukrainian side. And of course, this town had a fire brigade and this is their trucks. I took a photo once again back in 2019 and you could tell it used to be uh, saying Shorsk on it. They just kind of re repainted partial door and replaced name from Shorsk to Snovsk. Otherwise, it's the same truck that they used uh, for years during the Soviet days. But it's a newer model of gas truck. Uh, so that's probably was made sometimes in the late 80s. And I found this kind of unusual, but they had another fire truck displayed on a pedestal like a monument to the local firefighters. And this is all wheel drive. So it could be used out in the country on the dirt roads. This brick tower, probably water tower, is located next to the train station. And it's one of the local points of interest. It was probably built sometimes in the early 1900s. If you guys watch my video, the slideshow from the shores of Lake Baikal, that small Russian village, you may recognize the look. This building looks exactly the same as those ones. So I assume before revolution, people had money. They built similar looking homes with the nice shutters and the crown molding around the windows. And even the palisade in the front of the building looks similar. So I guess that was the thing before the revolution. And this is type of homes I get used to see in the villages in northern Ukraine. So those probably were built in the 1950s, 1960s. So you see only two windows in the front of the house. And they're kind of smaller scale and not as fancy. And I just got confirmation that there was a natural gas in Shors, Snovsk. Uh, this house is for sale right now in Snovsk for $10,000. And you see there's a gas line going into that house. And of course, every Saturday and Sunday at the special location where they have stalls, they'll have the like so-called Kalhozny Bazaar, collective farm market, where the people from nearby villages will bring their produce, they bring milk, sour cream, meat, potatoes, whatever in season. And you need to keep in mind, usually prices at the market will be twice or maybe even triple the prices you could get at the grocery stores, except quite often there is nothing in a grocery store but there is sour cream at the market. And speaking of groceries, that was the main problem living in small towns like that. That would be on the bottom of the list for supplies. I'm planning to make a separate video on the whole supply side of the Soviet Union because people who lived in Moscow, Leningrad, even Kyiv, they had a way different story about how the stores looked and what could be purchased at the stores comparing with people who lived in small towns like Snovsk. Those were... You know, we had a, like a top category, so it was a special category. That's for Moscow and Leningrad, then maybe Kiev. Then it was first category, second category, third category, and the fourth. And I bet you that Muhasransk town will be on the fourth category, so hardly anything in the stores for sale ever. And of course, it created this constant flow of people. Uh, so young people from the villages trying to escape the collective farms and move at least into the small town like Snovsk. While young people in Snovsk, after getting education done, they'll try to go in the big cities like Kiev or Moscow, get into college and try to stay there 
because life is way better there compared with Snovsk. So it's constantly this movement of young people. So that's why small villages dying out first now that small towns are dying out next. So we have this urbanization going on in modern Ukraine and Russia. And I almost forgot, I have a really good joke about Mukhasransk and the lifestyle there. So this is going on in Moscow. So a student came from out of town and he's really struggling to join the entry exams. The teacher is trying to help him out. So he's like, well, okay, do you know at least anything? Can you tell me what day of the week right now? And the student replies, I don't know. So of course, teacher is like, what? Well, do you know at least what year is this right now? And he's like, I don't know either. <laughs> so teacher, okay, can you tell me who is our president? And student replies again, I know you won't believe me, but I have no idea. So teacher again, okay, I'm sorry. What town are you from? And student replies, I'm from Muhasransk. So teacher leans against the window, looks outside and says, wow, I wish I could just drop everything and move to Muhasransk. <laughs> Okay, my friends, I think it's all I can tell you about Soviet era Hicksville, Mukhasransk. I hope you enjoyed the story and maybe learned something new. As always, please don't forget to like it, comment, and thank you everyone who supports my channel through membership and Patreon. And we'll talk to you soon. До свидания. Goodbye.